Hi. <laughs> this is interesting. It's nice to be back in a college environment. It, the microphones remind me of a multiple choice test, though. Is it <laughs> A or B or C? I'm uh, having a little test anxiety here. <laughs> OK, can you hear me? How's that? Good. Literary mastermind George Saunders tells us that there's a tradition that's evolved around the college commencement address where some old geezer in his best years behind him, that would be me today, gets up in front of a group of young people with their best years ahead of them, that would be all of you today, and gives them advice, whether they want to hear it or not. And as George taught us, I'm going to respect that tradition this afternoon, but I'm going to try and make it personal and keep it real One of the great things about being human, besides love, which is probably the best thing, is that we humans don't have to learn everything by trial and error. We have a rich descriptive language that we can use to relate our experiences, our life stories, if you will, to one another in journals, through word of mouth, through conversations with a friend, through sharing personal episodes with people. And we can learn from each other's stories, right? Avoiding the mistakes that led others astray and repeating what's worked to get us to the good stuff faster. So my goal today is to share some thinly veiled life lessons with you. My college daughters would be going, oh, already, but my goal is to show you some thinly veiled life lessons that basically that they don't teach you in college. Stuff I learned the hard way. I've had a reasonably successful life and I've learned from my successes. But my most significant lessons, the most significant lessons I've learned have come from my spectacularly embarrassing failures. So hopefully if I tell these stories well today, this very last, very last, we promise, Keystone Lecture will help you smooth your life path forward as you leave this place for what lies ahead. Well, class of 2014, I have to tell you, it is really hard to believe, but in round figures, it has been 40 years since I stood on this stage as the president of the Keystone Student Senate and closed the graduation ceremonies with a prayer. It's nearly four decades. I really am getting to be an old geezer here, right? I can't be that old. Uh, I was just snowboarding and bicycle riding and things last winter. That's a lot of years and it's a lot of stories. And I've only got about 10 minutes here, so let me jump right in. One of the first lessons that it took me decades, and I mean that literally, to learn, is to be wary of merry-go-rounds and treadmills. <laughs> Not the fun kind or the kind that help you exercise. I actually do a lot of treadmill exercise in the winter. Here's a merry-go-round. You do well in high school so that you can get into a great college like Keystone. You do well in college so you can get a good job. You do well in your first job so you can get a better job. You work harder and harder and harder and harder, moving almost feverishly from one goal to the next, hardly noticing the journey along the way barely taking notice of your transitions or your accomplishments. Now make no mistake, ambition and effort are great things. As you heard a minute ago, I left Keystone. Um, I went to college on and off for 17 more years after I left here, including the two I went here. It wasn't a four-year school then, so two years and that was it, you're out. And as you heard, I finished a bachelor's at Syracuse and master's at Rutgers and engineering at Penn and PhD at Rutgers and I did some business school at Wharton and business strategy training at MIT and so on and so on. And that was all good. And I provided well for my family. And I'd do it all again. And I recommend it to you. But there's also a danger to guard against. And that's not stopping to smell the proverbial roses. Not pausing to celebrate your accomplishments. Congratulations, by the way. Today is a really big day for all of you and a really significant accomplishment. Well done. Thank you. 
Anyway, therein lies the merry-go-round. For many decades, I endlessly chased success, moving from one goal to the next to the next, not stopping to get off the merry-go-round once in a while and reflect on what it accomplished, who I was, who I was becoming. So my first thought that I wanted to share with you is to pause to evaluate your life from time to time, at least annually, if not more often, and make adjustments in your life trajectory as you go. Start that today, right after you leave here, because today is a really significant time for you. A corollary is to stay away from treadmills. Who wants to exercise anyway? <laughs> now it's good for you. By treadmill, I mean the endless pursuit of something long after it's necessary or it serves your best interests. J. Paul Getty, at a time when he had more money than anyone else on the planet, was asked in an interview, how much is enough? How much is enough? And his answer was classic. Do you know it? Just a little bit more, right? Just a little bit more. The man had billions and billions and hundreds of billions in today's dollars, right? Just a little bit more. Think about that for a minute. It's a race with no end, right? It's a race with no end. I escaped that trap in the 1990s with the help of my pastor and friend, Ed Banghart, who helped me to see that there is an absolute financial number that is truly enough and that an endless run to see just how much money I could make didn't constitute a meaningful life. My colleagues and business associates thought I was absolutely crazy, I will tell you, in 1998 when after sealing a series of companies which I heard some things about that I'd created for many millions of dollars, admittedly, I announced that I was retiring to start a charitable foundation and that I was putting more money into the foundation than I was keeping for myself. They looked at me with wide eyes and went, come on, Turok. We'll make you a billionaire, man. Stick around, billion with a B. You're out of your mind dropping out now. Many of them took me aside and gave me long lectures. You will never have a chance like this again, they said. But it wasn't the right path for me. Let me tell you something. It was one of the best decisions, if not the best decision, I have ever made in my entire life. I got to know my kids before they moved out on me. <laughs> kids do that. I got to help people in all kinds of ways. My foundation built buildings and we started a charitable aviation group where we flew sick people around and uh, we sponsored all kinds of research, educated people about the environment, put a lot of people through college. That was ultimately more rewarding than adding zeros to my bank account. Helping people is a tremendously intrinsically rewarding thing to do with your life. So treadmills are good for exercise, but in life, no one has time to get off for a while and think about what you're doing. Okay, so how much is enough, right? What's your answer to the J. Paul Getty question? How much is enough, you ask? Well, that number is different for every person. And it's something that you have to experiment with and you have to figure out for yourself can't even give you advice there. But I will tell you that psychologists that do uh, quantitative experimental research on happiness have determined that on average, uh, in the United States, people are optimally happy with a salary of about $70,000 per year. Might surprise you. And after that, significant increases in financial resource lead to insignificant changes in perceived happiness. Stream the movie Happy if you haven't seen it. H-A-P-P-Y, Happy. It's on Amazon, Netflix, Vudu, all the streaming services. Charles Spurgeon said this very well. It's not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes real happiness. A lesson I'm still learning, a work still in progress for me, all these decades later, is that you can't always change the circumstances that you're in. But you can change how you respond to those circumstances, your attitude, if you will. And that can make all the difference in the world as to whether you perceive life or whether you're happy or miserable about life. When my kids were young, we read a book together. It took us almost a year, I think. 
We read a book together before bedtime called Children Just Like Me. It was by Annabelle and Barnabas Kindersley. And the Kindersleys had actually traveled the planet. They'd gone to a couple hundred countries around the world. And they interviewed and photographed young children who lived in all different kinds of circumstances. Curiously, the young woman who lived in Beverly Hills in a $50 million home with multiple swimming pools, personal coaches, and every material thing she could imagine, and probably then some, seemed a bit sad about life, felt a lot of pressure, and found daily living somewhat burdensome. But there was a young child named Mina, a young girl that lived in the poorest slums of India, whose home was a piece of scrap metal suspended over four rusty 55-gallon oil drums whose father was a manual laborer and had to look for, and search for work every day. This child was astonishingly, unimaginably happy. Probably the happiest kid in the whole book. She looked at life differently. She was captivated by the sunshine, the sight of her father's face when he returned home, and the taste of the bread that he sometimes brought with him if he'd found work that day. Her attitude made all the difference in the way she experienced life. For her, life was a wonderful adventure, despite living in poverty that most of us would consider absolutely untenable. I've had a lot of financial success in my life. Right? And people often say, well, hey, what's your secret? <laughs> I believe a big part of my financial success was simply that I wasn't chasing money. My parenting partner and I always said that we'd enjoy what we had, but that we'd always try and keep our perspective, remember the circumstances we come from, and be ready to move into a one-room trailer, kids, dog, and all, if it became necessary. Rich or poor, we resolved to look at the positive side of life and stay upbeat as much as we could muster. I have to say it was a formula that worked well for us. We saw many of our friends overextend themselves and have to work multiple jobs to support their mortgage. One friend in particular used to come to work every morning and cry because she had to leave her children at home to pay the mortgage on their big house, and although she knew the house was bigger than the family really needed, she and her husband just couldn't let it go. Last point on this passage about money and happiness, and then I should move on. Uh, first of all, save money and invest in your future. Um, don't buy anything you can't pay off at the end of the month. Like you've probably heard that one before, I guess, but that may be a house and a car. I opened a letter from a credit card company the other day, and they informed me that they were now charging me 27% interest on my purchases. And I looked it up, and according to CNN, that's actually pretty good. Typical interest rates now go up as high as 36%. Uh, I don't know what you'd call that, but I'd call that bank robbery, the kind where the bank is robbing you and me. <laughs> Much easier to save and then buy. If you do the numbers, you'll see you spend a lot more for things you buy ahead. OK, next life lesson is on intuition. Intuition is a wonderful thing. And in my experience, uh, when we ignore our intuition, it is usually to our detriment. In his book, The Gift of Fear, Gavin De Becker tells us that most women who are attacked have an instinctual premonition of danger before the attack ever happens. They feel something is wrong, but they ignore their feelings and put themselves in the path of danger anyway. Seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Why would we do that? Let me try an example. Um, imagine that you're a woman. Guys, we'll get to you in a minute. Imagine that you're a woman alone in a parking garage at night. And you're waiting for an elevator, because that's the only way to get out. And the elevator door opens to reveal a man. Now, you feel something's wrong. You even feel an inner sense of dread. Maybe your, your heart's pounding. You're feeling something's wrong about this person, right? What would you do? Well. Rather than appear rude, most women will get on the elevator. Men, look, we have this problem too, right? We walk into situations that we know are dangerous because we think it'd be cowardly to walk away. Right? It's not manlike to walk away from that. And De Becker in his book, and I recommend it, asserts that we humans are the only animals on the planet that ignore their instincts of danger and talk ourselves out of running away when that's exactly what we need to do. The lesson's not just about physical danger. 
If you know something's wrong for you, whatever it is, a new job, a new girlfriend, something that someone's trying to get you to do that you know in your heart is just mm, not going to work out in the long term, right? Turn away from that at the first moment. Refuse to let thoughts of that action come back into your consciousness and trust your instincts. Don't doubt yourself. It may well save your physical life, but it could also save your professional or psychological life, professional or psychological life as well. In life, I have found that your thoughts become your actions, and your actions become your behaviors. Your behaviors then become your patterns, and your patterns become your destiny. That means that you have to be very mindful of who you're in bed with, literally and figuratively. Um, but the point's not about who you hook up with. It's not a talk on lecture on AIDS or STDs. It's about who you let into your heart. Who's in your inner circle? Choose your close friends, and especially your wife, your husband, your partner, very, very, very carefully. A solid, compatible partner is one of life's greatest blessings. And a troubled relationship is one of life's worst curses. It literally gets you where you live. So I said I'd make this personal, so I'm going to try this. I learned this lesson ever so much the hard way after I left Keystone. I went to Syracuse where I met a beautiful, smart, fun-loving young woman who later became my wife. All through our courtship, though, I kept sensing that something was wrong. I had the sense that she drank too much. And I remember one day praying, asking God for a sign that would come down from heaven that would make the decision to stay in this relationship or leave it easy. And half an hour later, she walked out of the liquor store that was right across the street from my student office with, um, where I happened, just happened to be looking out the window, which I didn't do all that often, with three gallons of wine, which she promptly hid in the back closet of her dorm room and consumed them over the next couple of days. The answer couldn't have been more clear, could it? I ignored these instincts, though. And even um, a bit of what some would call divine intervention in the answer to my prayer, and I was married. And a few years later, after my precious wife and I had inextricably interwoven our hearts into one, she died from alcohol poisoning and liver failure. I still carry the scars of bailing her out of jail and the embarrassment of family and friends and the sadness of having lost my soulmate. So I say to you from personal experience, trust your instincts. Turn away from trouble at the first moment. It can save you a lifetime of difficulty later. So let's get happy again. Let's talk about work. Um, first, in thinking about a career, something you're probably all thinking about these days, right? Consider a Venn diagram. The intersection of what you love, what you can do well, and the, what the world will pay you really well for. Right? Three circles, and think about the intersection of those three things. In careers, I call that the winner's circle. And in your career, um, even in a winner's circle career, know that there is really no magic bullet and no easy road. Hard work does pay off, believe it or not. If you haven't read it, I recommend reading the book or watching the YouTube, uh, The Last Lecture of Randy Posh. Has anybody read that? Just a quick show of hands. Yeah, okay, some people. It's, um, it's on the net. He was a, a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I think. Um, it's a cornucopia of wisdom about work and career life. One key point is that in your professional life, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. I'm sure you know the old adage, right? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Don't need to go over that here. But, but it's true, especially for your professional life. Be extra bold. Take legitimate, underscore legitimate, take legitimate professional risks without trepidation. Nelson Mandela once said that the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, but in rising up every time we fail. When I was starting my own businesses, I made bold decisions, bet the company decisions, literally every week. If it blew up, we would just do something else, right? Um, with a lot of hard work, my team and I turned, I don't know, $50,000 investment into about $120 million in a couple of years. It worked well for us, but we worked hard. If I'd stopped, though, and I'd overthought what I was doing at any step of the way, I would surely have lost heart and folded up in a quivering heap of anxiety. Um, bold 
in your career, I believe, is the way to go. As Franklin D. Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Also, in business and in life, this came up earlier, don't be afraid to ask the question, whatever the question is. Don't assume that you know the answer, as long as the question is legitimate, or that the answer is no. Go ahead and ask the question anyway. The answer may surprise you. It did me. It often surprised me a number of times when I was asking to have something funded or asking for someone to be a customer. And then, when you are successful beyond your wildest dreams, and I met some students today, and I'm sure it's true for many more that I haven't met, that are in this league, and I think you're going to happen for you. But when you're successful beyond your wildest dreams, be humble. The truly great minds of the world don't have an exaggerated sense of self-importance. They're humble. And they're not as self-aggrandizing. Remember this when you discover that you're one of those great minds. Arrogance is a sign of weakness, not strength. I've worked with lots of interesting people, people from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I've shared conversation with three United States presidents, had bosses who won Nobel Prizes. I've known several self-made billionaires and so on. The people that are truly brilliant, the true achievers, exude a quiet confidence that energizes you just being in the room with them. The loud and the arrogant, generally not worth listening to and certainly not worth imitating. Humility and humbleness being more powerful than brash and cocky. Lastly, on careers. In career in your life, there's the old song about no one to hold up and no one to fold up, and I think that's true here too. When things go bad, especially professionally, don't hang around forever. Make an effort to make it better. I don't mean to give up at the first moment, but after a time, move on. Alexander Graham Bell once said, that when one door closes, three others open. But we spend so much time looking at the door that's closed that we fail to see the three doors that have opened and the opportunity those doors have created for us. I will tell you, I've probably started 12, 15 businesses. Yeah, three or four of them were what I'd call a success. Sometimes things just don't work. That's okay. It's okay to fail. You learn from the failures. Okay, we're almost done. Um, next subject, family. I saved the best till last. I was just reminded this in meeting David and his beautiful wife and his children at lunch. For many people, including me, there's no greater joy than having a couple of kids and a dog <laughs> and nurturing them from little saplings into thinking, feeling adults. If I add up all the other things I've done in life and multiply by 100 million, it's dwarfed, really, by the simple joy of having and raising a family. Not that you shouldn't work, but it's, something, it's, a not, it's uh, something not to be missed, I believe. If you invest yourself in the process, I will tell you it is the scariest project you will ever take on. More than promising a billion dollars worth of goods or whatever, it is the scariest thing you will ever take on, but it is also the most rewarding. So now, in closing, I have to end on some bad news, which is really good news in disguise. Um, many of you have uh, thought that your education ended when you took your last final exam, or you're thinking out there now that it will at last, finally, truly be over when Turok shuts up, sits down, and this lecture ends. <laughs> but actually, it's just starting. I hated school when I arrived here in 1975. I resented anybody who wanted to educate me or teach me anything. I thought I already knew everything that I needed to know. Looking back now at who I was then, I just have to laugh. Somewhere along the way, I learned that all of life is an educational experience. It's not just about classes. Every day, I get a little wiser, even in my old age. Every day, I become more aware of just how much I still have to learn. Learning doesn't stop when you graduate. Every day brings about changes in me and changes in the world around me. And in your generation, much more than in mine, that change is going to happen faster and faster and faster. And chances are you're going to have to adapt to changing careers and changing circumstances many, many times. My father, who went to Keystone as well, and my mother, and my mom had multiple careers, but my dad had one career for 35 years. 
not really possible anymore. So there's a lot of change in store for you. But a good friend taught me to celebrate that change, to be energized by it, rather than to seek a life of complacency. In closing then, I wish for each of you a life well lived. Today you are born of this place. It's the little arch there as you go out, right? I know that what Keystone did for me, it has also done for you, if you've let it. That means you are prepared for success. I close then paraphrasing the words of Henry David Thoreau and my father, Frank Michael Turok, who said, life proceeds out of your intentions for it. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life that you've imagined. Make it happen. Class of 2014, good luck, God bless, and live well. <laughs>